I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, January 5th, 2024. Happy New Year. Good to have you on board, as always, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, our members have provided the foundation for everything we do, from proceedings and naval history to press books to events and conferences. Members receive Proceedings Magazine, print and digital or digital only, and big discounts on Naval Institute press books and invitations to member-only events. To become a member of the Institute, go to usni.org forward slash join and use our holiday code, which is good till the end of January, Holly 23, to get $10 off today. Now to introduce my guest, Captain Holman Agard, U.S. Navy, is author of an article in the January Proceedings. It's titled, Surface Ship Repair Culture Needs a Refit. He's joining us from his home in Chantilly, Virginia. Holman, great to have you on the show. Bill, thank you so much for having me. Great to be with you today, and Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Amazing. I don't know how we got to 2024 so quickly, but whew, yeah. Um, so let's start with your background a little bit. You're a surface warfare officer. Uh, tell us how you were commissioned and what your career path has been up to now. Absolutely, Bill. Uh, you know, first off, I just want to thank you again for one, having me on the program today uh, to discuss something that is very near and dear uh, to me in, in surface ship uh, repair maintenance. And to, uh, to you and your editorial team for, for working very patiently with me, emphasis on patiently uh, with me, insisting me in entering the public domain, uh, public, uh, public discourse uh, through my article. Uh, now to your question. Uh, I'm a prior enlisted engineer. Uh, so I commissioned uh, through, well, enlisted right out of high school, did about three years as, uh, as an engineer and then enlisted, or excuse me, commissioned through uh, the Boost program, which is now uh, nested into a uh, seaman at Admiral 21. Uh, that culminated in a ROTC scholarship uh, that I commissioned uh, in 2000 uh, from Southern, Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, commissioned as a SWO. Uh, my time as a SWO uh, has been on cruisers and destroyers. I've been stationed in Mayport, Norfolk, uh, and most recently uh, Pearl Harbor. My most recent tour at sea has been XO and then CO on USS Hopper amazing Grace Hopper out of Pearl Harbor. Uh, during my time as a SWO, I, I, I've gone through roughly about half a dozen or so uh, uh, shipyard uh, repair availabilities, and that's kind of where I'm, the experience that I'm speaking from or uh, read, writing on uh, in the article. Uh, fantastic. I, I love the fact that you started out as an engine man, uh, which I think you know even brings extra cre credibility to this whole maintenance, maintenance culture, uh, ship uh, availability, all of that uh, discussion. So uh, your article is really about shipyards um, and the repair culture at Navy shipyards and shipyards that, that support the Navy, the private shipyards that support the Navy. Uh, so what spurred you to write it? Thanks for that question. Uh, the bottom line is this. I, I, I firmly feel uh, that if, um, if the service, surface Navy is going to be uh, prepared uh, to, to meet an eventual high-end or a protracted conflict uh, with a with a peer competitor, uh, then we've got to get a little bit better uh, with timely and predictable ship repair. Uh, so, I've been, uh, as I mentioned, I've been through a few a few avails, um, and only one of those avails actually completed on time uh, or under budget. Uh, the one actually was on Hopper when I was EXO. Uh, I, was, I showed up as a, you know tail end of, of that that avail period. Uh, so to be clear, uh, you know, in the last 10 years or so, the service community has seen a lot of improvements uh, in, in how we do surface ship repair. Uh, you know, initiatives such as firm fixed price, the, um, the adjustment on how the budget is done between uh, a multi-ship, multi-option, um, or a firm fixed price uh, kind, of, uh, kind of model. Um, and there have been a number of different initiatives that, that have been implemented, and we've seen some moderate success with that. Uh, I, I think I think we should continue to to, to use those uh, initiatives as levers uh, to get better uh, with our uh, with our completion rates uh, in in exit pr predictability. But I also would add um, that we can look at another component, uh, and that that piece is culture. Uh, so um, culture is stressed quite a bit, um, especially with service warfare officers that are preparing for command. Um, 
I'm, I, you know, I'm in the pipeline now to go back to command. Uh, and I've, in, a, in every, just about every class that I'm in or every um, opportunity, uh, culture is either stressed uh, explicitly or it's implied. Uh, and I think that there's there's a need for culture to be talked about writ large within the overall maintenance team as a surface ship is going through uh, the availability. So uh, for our listeners who haven't been on a ship in a repair availability, talk a little bit about what what it's like and who's in charge. Uh, you know, because there's your article brings this out. There's there's really. You know, you've got the commanding officer and the, the the triad at the top of the of the ship itself, right? And you know, CO is always responsibility, uh, always responsible for the ship. Uh, but then you've got uh, either the company or the the, the Navy shipyard, um, and then you've got other you've got subcontractors. Uh, you've got the CEO of the shipyard itself. There's there's this is uh, right. you know, this is uh, a lot of ingredients for kind of a mixed up stew of accountability, as I read it. Uh, so who's in charge and then, you know, how do those cultures uh, perhaps clash in, when, in the yard? Bill, you codified that brilliantly. I mean, it is a bit of a, uh, I did go to school in Louisiana, so it, it is a bit of a gumbo. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of different ingredients that, that play into that. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to apologize ahead of time to all of my uh, brothers and sisters in the, uh, in the engineering duty officer corps uh, for overly simplifying, but broadly uh, you've got the ship and her crew. Uh, you know, led by the, the CEO and the officers there. You also have, uh, you've got a shipyard, the shipyard leadership um, comprised of uniform and civilian personnel um, that uh, represent the, the government in ensuring uh, that an avail is uh, conducted on time, on budget. Uh, and they also have a quality assurance component to ensure that we're getting, you know, we're getting the best bang for our buck. Uh, for you know, for the taxpayer dollar, uh, and then there's the there's the lead maintenance activity. Uh, so think of well, you know BAE or Vigor Shipyard, the actual private uh, shipyard. In the case of surface, you know non nuclear ship repair, uh, that you have that component, and they're the executors. And yes, they do use subcontractors, some sub subcontractors for uh, for certain events, uh, certain um, certain pieces of maintenance, but they're the overall responsible for the execution of that. Uh, so you've got um, you've got that that you know that mix of uniformed personnel, uh, contractors, government civilians, um, and there is a dialectic or a tension, if you will, um, that uh, in in some ways is healthy. Um, you know, you to, you you want to you want to put those uniform members in check that just want the ship ready to go back to the fleet now, 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 um, and so it's good to have. Um, you know, an entity that doesn't necessarily have that demand so that there is a healthy tension of, you no, know, we want the right product and the right quality and uh, we want to, you know, uh, reach reach a particular standard. Um, the, 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 the problematic issue um, is in um, one, as you have these different entities, they all have different cultures and they all have different um, levels of standards. Uh, and there is an inherent friction um, and uh, a lot of times distrust that has to be worked through. Um, to your question about accountability, um, the it's a it is a shared it's a shared accountability. The CEO is responsible for uh, the overall safety uh, and uh, and training of the crew. The shipyard is uh, is that government rep that is responsible for ensuring that uh, that the the avail is done on time and in budget and. Uh, the the lead maintenance activity is responsible for executing that. Um, however, they they are a business, um, and uh, and they are they are driven by uh, by costs and profits. Uh, so you have all those things. I would submit to you where the issue becomes uh, is in identifying the one lead person or or entity to hold fully accountable for the execution of a ship of a surface ship repair. Um, I, I, I will I will share this with you, Bill. Um, I'm I'm a Detroit Lions fan. Uh, so um, it, with that, no, we're doing good this year. Uh, yes, absolutely. We're doing, we're doing good this year. But when that team went 0-16, um, there was no question 
that the head coach was going to be held accountable. And the, the head coach was head, held accountable because uh, he not only was responsible, but he had the authority to implement changes as he saw fit. He could have benched this wide receiver or benched the quarterback, or uh, he could have replaced his offensive coordinator. Uh, he could have done a number of different things. Um, what I submit is the the challenge that we are faced with uh, in in the uh, in the terms of, of surface ship repair is that you can hold someone accountable. Um, the the problem because becomes that entity or person that you hold accountable. Do they have the authority and resources uh, to make the necessary decisions that need to happen? Uh, and so um, I'm you know I'm not looking for anybody to get fired. Um, I'm not looking for uh, any major investigation or anything to 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 to, uh, to transpire. Uh, the 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 problem is though, how do you hold um, a lead maintenance activity uh, accountable if they don't meet a milestone that they projected that they would meet? Um, uh, how do you properly reward um, a lead maintenance activity who has had multiple um, ships uh, that complete on time? Uh, and I think there's there's a there's a there's an issue there um, that that we need to look at. I unfortunately don't have the answer to it, um, but that we I think we can look at as far as how can we um, one name someone or an entity uh, wholly accountable and then give them the authority and resources they need to execute that. So let's pull that thread a little bit more. Um, you know, who would you suggest would be the the right entity in a in a shipyard to hold accountable? Who and 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 if you did that right, if that happened, how how would you shift those resources or the um, uh, the, the 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 responsibilities, I guess, uh, to that that one entity to to make this work better? How, you know, what, what's what do you have in mind for that? I, I would I would love to I would love to see our 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 shipyards um, uh, have, a, have a you know a bit more um, levers that they could uh, pull to hold um, uh, to hold the the maintenance activity uh, accountable. That is Holman Agard's opinion, um, but it but it but it would be um, now the now the actual you know, following through with that and, and, and putting contracts and whatnot in place. Unfortunately, I'm not smart enough to, to speak to what can be done to enable that. Um, but I, but I would love to see, uh, you know, some of our, you know, some of our hardworking, well-intentioned, um, uh, you know, great Americans uh, within, within the shipyard organization who um, have seen, uh, you know, a, an activity or activities uh, multiple times who have, you know, not met the mark uh, if you know if they if they have the um, the the wasp, if you will to uh, to either suspend a, a, a contract or um, you know hold off before awarding another uh, contract to a, to a lead maintenance activity if they if they have a bad trend um, some some form of uh, stronger um, accountability or you know, dare I say punishment uh, if um, if if warranted. Uh, you know, you, you you have you know. Of course, I have to have to account for. In recent years, we 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 all have been affected by the pandemic. So of course, you 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 place that in as a as a factor uh, as to why we may not be meeting the mark. Um, if it is something that you can you can tie to that, um, then then that's you know something that is out, outside of control, outside of your controls. Um, I spoke to that a little bit in the in, in the article of you know that if we did a little bit more like what the nuclear officer corps does in near miss critiques um, in actually critiquing why we may have missed a milestone or why we actually might have missed um, the mark on a ship exiting on time um, and you know we asked essentially the five whys of how can how did this unfold uh, and then we can actually look to say okay well this was because uh, we had this long lead material that didn't arrive on time. Well, why didn't it arrive on time? Well, um, it didn't arrive on time because we didn't order it on time mm -hmm. or um, uh, because, you know, a piece of a, a, a material was on uh, was on a was on a Maersk uh, liner and, and it was uh, affected by what's going on in the Red Sea or something, you know, something along those lines. So we can have a sure. better understanding uh, and then we could uh, properly address um, 
uh, how we how we can get better. But I, but I'd love to see if the you know if our shipyards were more more enabled to do that. Yeah, and I uh, immediately come to think about uh, incentive structure or the incentives. You know, you 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 threw out, and I know you don't mean this. You know, punishment if if some if if wickets get missed, right? But it, it also comes down to, you know, that incentive structure. How do you incentivize incentivize the, the behavior and the uh, productivity that you want? And then also find ways to say, hey, this is not, um, you know, this doesn't pass muster if you're missing these gates for, for these reasons. You know, there are some things that, you know, nobody can control. COVID being one, of course. Right. Um, but there are ways to, you know, to mitigate those things. And also, I just want to uh, I'll editorialize for a second. I'll throw out my my former boss, Admiral Daly, who was our CEO, who was a SWO. Um, and uh, he, we we talked about this topic about you know ship maintenance and maintenance backlogs and getting ships out of. And and he liked to uh, point out that in the twenty in the two thousands and early twenty tens, uh, the Navy was steaming really hard. So ships. That you know, I'll harken back to John Lehman being on the show about two years ago, when he said he was Secretary of the Navy. They designed it and and held accountable a no kidding six month deployment cycle because ships are really meant to not be you know driven hard for longer than six months, and then you start to have maintenance backlogs, you start to have problems exacerbated yes. when you go on seven, eight, nine, ten month deployments. And so Admiral Daly would like to say that, you know, what the surface Navy did for quite some time, um, not its own choice, by the way, was that uh, these longer deployments, it was like if you, if somebody, if you bought a BMW and then you failed to change the oil on time, but somebody gave you lots of gas money to spend and go burn up the gas money, but no, you can't stop and change your oil or buy new tires and, and do the maintenance required, right? So you ended up with this maintenance backlog on ships like Hopper, DDG-70, one of the early, you know, uh, 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 early Burks. Um, and and that those chickens are, have come home to roost now. Uh, and, and so we're, as you mentioned, working out of that backlog, uh, it takes culture, it takes a dedicated, concerted effort. Um, it, it also is going to take some level of demand signal, mo you know, moderation. Um, you know, you look at the USS Ford. I know it's not, we're not talking about uh, DVG here, but the Ford is just coming back now from what, what turned into an eight plus month deployment. It was intended to go on its first deployment and be about a four month deployment. So, you know, th that kind of use on a ship, any ship, when you double it or, or add significantly to it, it, it has back end costs that, you know, somebody, a crew, a shipyard is going to have to catch up with at some point. Um, all, yeah, all good points. And I, I'm sorry to editorialize a little bit there, but I, this is a topic that is getting, it's getting a lot of attention. It's getting a lot of attention in our pages over the last couple of years. You know, this uh, JOs are writing about, hey, how, how hard it is to go to your first ship or submarine and and expect to be operating at sea and okay yeah you know the ship's in an availability but that that you know six month or turns into twelve months turns into you know longer it's it's hard it's hard on the crew as well um, so you one of the things that you mentioned in your article is truthful reporting talk about that a little bit more thanks and Bill thank you for the opportunity to, to get after that portion uh, of the article uh, because what I what I um, uh, what I did not mean um, uh, was that there is this overall culture of dishonesty um, within the maintenance organization. That that's that's not the case. Um, what the truthful reporting that I'm referring to is that there is a tendency, uh, while a ship is in the avail, uh, there are certain there are many many milestones that have to be met. Um, you know, some on critical path, some not on critical path to to uh, to the completion of the avail. Uh, for an example, uh, the um, the planned completion date or PCD uh, projected completion date uh, uh, of of an avail. Um, let's say, for instance, that that is in any case a one December. You know, so it's one December is when we're shooting to do that. Um, but but we know. Uh, in early September, that because of 
some part that didn't arrive or because of uh, a lack of a critical welder or whatever it might be, we think that we may not be able to get to get to that date on time or get to get to uh, PCD on time. Well, there's a tendency to um, to not report that too soon. Um, and and there are um, again out, outside of my um, outside of my scope and breadth of knowledge, but there are many reasons for um, for not disclosing that uh, from a contractual basis uh, too soon. Um, and and then there's also a a um, inherent uh, unwritten um, uh, risk of if you disclose that that you're not going to make a one December date. If you disclose that in September, then all the workers and all the initiative and all the plans, uh, you're going to kind of take your foot off the gas uh, because if you know you can't meet it by one December, then you just you may as well just you know take it easy and just you know halfway work and um, you know not not work as hard. Um, I accept that. I accept those as 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 valid. Uh, reasons to um, to hold off as much as possible before you before you give that bad news. I'm unable to meet a milestone. I counter that though uh, with uh, the fact that or uh, the, the belief that um, reporting those things early. If you were to report in mid September instead of waiting until November, that there's a there, there's a there's a there's a risk that we may not meet this milestone. Now the entire team can work together to try to think of ways of, of, of ways we can mitigate that. Okay, you may not meet one December, but maybe 15 December. Um, what if we um, what if what if I reached out to um, this particular organization within the regional maintenance uh, center uh, to see if they might be able to have a critical welder or um, or could we fly someone in or you know could we elevate the problem uh, early enough to where we can get after, uh, that particular is issue. Um, now, I, I'm not saying that that never happens. Um, certainly does, um, and um, and and I've I've seen it in a couple different avails where you know that you know the the, the flares are raised up pretty early, and we we try to get after uh, fixing that. Um, but but as a as a whole, um, anecdotally, I've just witnessed a number of times where you know the entire organization knows that we can't meet a, a particular date. Um, and we just don't disclose that uh, for uh, for whatever for whatever reason. Uh, so um, I feel that uh, truthful and prompt reporting actually aids in a in a in an overall culture uh, binded by a, a signal you know a signal unity and purpose of of getting getting the ship repaired and back to the fight uh, back to the fleet. Um, I think it, it 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 has the potential to spawn ingenuity and creative thinking uh, and and cohesiveness um, that uh, that that we see a lot in, in in successful organizations inside and outside of the military. So I felt like I took a long time to explain that one, but that's no, no, that, was, that, that was perfect. Uh, you know, the, this ships are incredibly complex systems of systems. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, every uh, across the entire United States economy, people are talking at all levels of you know, business and government leadership about critical skills shortages, worker shortages. Uh, you know, it, unemployment is very low right now. But finding, as you pointed out, you know, the critical, the key welder and, and sometimes in supply chain management, it's the second tier uh, company that is supplying the subcomponent that goes into the component. So all these things can tend to, uh, you know, snowball into you know little problems into large problems. But I think your point that you know bad news does not get better with time, you know. So if you start to see these these snowballs start to develop, you're as an organization or you know several organizations in a shipyard with the ship, if you raise those up quickly and you start to think about well, you know, could we move this? Could we ask for this? Could we elevate this to the level of somebody who has the authority or the the budgetary authority, you know, to make this happen, to bring us that that critical part or something, I, I think that's really important. And uh, so, you you write about a, a historic example 
um, you know, and and you also write about a more recent example that I was not aware of that that took part up in the uh, Puget Sound, Puget Sound shipyard up in uh, in Washington State. Uh, so talk about the the USS Yorktown in World War II, and you know, recount that story for us. A lot of our listeners will be aware of it. Some won't. Uh, and, and lessons and inspiration that can be drawn from it. Uh, absolutely. So the USS Yorktown carrier uh, CV-5 um, was uh, a, a huge part of Battle of Coral Sea, but it took a lot of damage during that during that battle. Um, and that was in the May time frame, 1942. Um, and uh, when when those uh, when those uh, when the when those um, uh, when the ship took all that damage, pulled into Pearl Harbor. Uh, and um, prior to even pulling into Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor they, they sent out, you know, uh, engineers to assess the damage. Um, and you know, so it was, it was en route to pulling back in. And uh, it was determined that it would take about 90 days to, to, to fix that. Um, so uh, Nimitz in the dry dock. Uh, and I love telling the story because I can I like picture it all, the, you know, as, as, I'm, as I'm telling it. But uh, Nimitz is in the dry dock still, you know, the water still letting out and he's got, you know, water up to his, you know, just just above his ankles, and he's walking around and looking, looking, and he's like, "All right, great. It's gonna take ninety days to fix this. You have three days." Um, and uh, you know, of course, there was this, you know, initial shock, um, but you know, there was a resolve within the you know Pacific Fleet commander. We need the ship back uh, in in three days, based off of intelligence um, of what what would be the the Battle of Midway. Um, and suffice it to say. Um, and it would be disingenuous if I didn't, you know, qualify this. Um, they didn't do all the repairs that were supposed to be done within 90 days. Um, and, and, and there were certain uh, safety measures that were relented in order to, uh, to make things go faster. Uh, and the crew was involved uh, quite a bit in, um, in, in, that, in, that ship, in that ship repair. Um, uh, in fact, it got it away in three days with still, you know, some things that were, you know, buttoned up and duct taped. And um, so not everything was 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 addressed. Also, um, it would be disingenuous for me not to not to not to frame it in, in context of um, uh, it's it's not a clean relation to what's going on now because we're not at, in a total war, which like what we, you know, some strategists argue that we were um, at that particular time. Uh, so um, understand all of that. Um, the the point that I make, um, and I continue to make, uh, is that you had a group of people through multiple stakeholders that were unified in purpose, um, that were um, that coalesced together, uh, and um, and got the ship back underway in three days. Um, and and that's the um, ingenuity, uh, the esprit de corps, the elan that if I had a magic wand, I'd take it and bottle it up uh, and give it to every shipyard and every ship that's going into a, a, a maintenance avail uh, so that they'd have this. It's, 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 um, it, you, you can't see it. You can't touch it. Um, but, you know, um, you know, good an organization that has a good culture. Um, and I think if you could take that, bottle that up, um, just like ev every surface ship does that with their namesake, um, you know, with with the avails that 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 I went that I experienced with 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 Hopper, specifically the, the last one with the ex extended avail. Um, I made sure that everyone knew that we were doing this for Grace, Grace Hopper. Um, so, you know, it'd be nothing to see a contractor that's walking on the ship and you look, Hey, Captain, we're doing it for grace. That's right. We're doing it for grace. Nice. Um, and, and that type of Alon, that type of, you know, um, spirit or, or, or a unified culture, uh, is, is what we need to, what we need to, um, foster more, um, in, in our, in our avails. Um, so, is the answer getting ball caps and patches with uh, the Yorktown silhouette on it? Maybe sounds kind of cool, but but um, but the answer is, you know, driving on that or using that 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 history uh, for uh, for for motivation uh, and and infusing your culture uh, with that. When I was on board, 
uh, USS Michael Mansour um, a few months ago, uh, probably actually a year ago now. Um, Michael Mansour himself has never stepped foot on board the USS Michael Mansour. However, that ship and that culture through multiple commands uh, embodies the, uh, the humility, the tenacity, and the grit of Michael Mansour. Um, uh, you could say the same thing about just about any other surface ship, um, you know, particularly ones that have, you know, uh, um, uh, medals of honor and, and, um, and, and named after uh, our heroes. Uh, you, 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 can, you can just sense that. Again, can't, can't see it, can't touch it, um, but you just know it's, you know it's there. Uh, I also drew upon a recent, uh, you know, recent history of, you know, what happened in, in, in Vigor uh, Shipyard uh, with, with USS Kidd. Um, you know, I'm, I remember that because uh, Hopper went into the yard shortly after um, that happened. And, you know, Admiral Aquilino was the Pacific Fleet commander at the time. And he actually made a trip out there and, and you know, and, and lauded those accomplishments. Um, and I think those are good. That's, you know, those are wins that we need to look that we need to look to, um, again, as an overall maintenance team. Um, I'm a SWO and I'm just as much as part of the problem as I am the solution. Uh, so uh, certainly, certainly not, um, you know, I can't, I can't, can't escape that, um, uh, and, you know, and it's, it's, it's part of, it's part of what every, every SWO has to go through. Um, and certainly we should, we should look to, to try to do that on a, on a larger, on a larger scale. Yeah, I, I love the way you put all that and especially, you know, the importance uh, and the power sometimes of drawing on history, uh, on naval history, on the, you know, the, the heroes that went before us, the Nimitzes and the Michael Monsors and, the, you know, the Grace Hoppers. And uh, I, I think that there's there's great power in that. Um, so you're headed back to command and congratulations. So you've uh, you had you had 05 level command, uh, a hopper. And you're you're uh, now you're captain now, and you're slated to go com to command as an 06. So that's major command, uh, but it's a DDG. So it, it, talk to me about that because I've I've heard the you know the news. Some of the DDGs are being kind of upgunned to 06 level commands. Um, how do how does the Navy decide that which ships are getting that? And uh, uh, and also you know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but you know Shoop is going to go into the yard period for a little bit before. <laughs> Uh, coming back out to sea. So just talk a little bit about Shoop and about, you know, going to a DDG as an 06 command. Yes. So, uh, yes, as you mentioned, I'll be fortunate enough to uh, to take command of USS Shoop while she is in the yard period. Uh, so uh, get to to, in the yard in Japan. That's correct. Yokosuka. That's correct. Yes. So um, have the opportunity to, 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 to see what I can do about the culture in that in that in that avail. Um, I'll show up about four months into an eight month, uh, eight month long uh, avail in in Yakuska. Uh, Shoop is a yes is a DDG, and I've I've um, uh, you know uh, spent a, spent a little bit of time kind of explaining what you know what that dynamic is. Um, my beloved cruisers, Tyco class cruisers, um, such an amazing uh, platform, uh, and did did so much uh, or did doing doing should say I shouldn't use past tense. Doing so much for the service community um, and the Navy and the Joint Force uh, writ large, um, she is she is that that platform is aging, um, and uh, we as the service Navy we do have uh, relief planned. Uh, the the Flight Three destroyers, um, John, Jack Lucas is is uh, the 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 first one DG one twenty five, um, and um, and so we're we're cranking those out, uh, and then eventually. Uh, the the platform known as DDGX will will come in and be the uh, the bona fide uh, relief uh, for uh, the cruiser platform uh, in in the way of uh, air and missile defense commander. Um, in the meantime, as the flight threes are coming up online uh, and we're preparing for the DDGX, um, because because of the rate that we're decommissioning our our cruisers, uh, we had to put a stopgap in place. Uh, so uh, in the time being, uh, we picked uh, four. Uh, destroyers that were already equipped with an advanced Aegis baseline, baseline nine, um, and uh, two for the two for the East Coast, uh, Winston S. Churchill, uh, and uh, the uh, the Lassen, uh, and then two on two in the Pacific Fleet, 
which would be the Frank Peterson and then uh, USSU out of out of Yakuska. Um, there's there's talk of expanding that number um, uh, to six or potentially eight. Um, uh, I've I've been out of the office for a little while, so I'm not not quite sure which which ones are coming up next. But it's a it's it is a um, it's a it's a stopgap um, uh, method that we're using uh, to um, to use a, a platform that that has an advanced Aegis ba baseline, uh, and then uh, we we've, we've changed the construct of uh, of the number of sailors. We've added some sailors to uh, to these platforms. Uh, we've uh, changed out the, the the way that our department heads are structured uh, structured much like a much like a cruiser. Um, and, uh, and then the executive officer is, uh, is, uh, is one that would, you, you normally would see, uh, on a, on a cruiser. So we've, we've adjusted the, the, the manning profile, uh, to as best as possible mimic a, a, a cruiser, uh, to best set up, um, the, uh, the air and missile defense commander to, to use that platform, uh, as a, you know, as a, as an air defense commander in the strike group. So will you, as the CEO of the ship, will you be, uh, strike, uh, alpha whiskey for a strike group? That that is correct. That is correct. Uh, FDNF is 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 you know slightly slightly different. So they you know they they've got a you know a couple of different um, O sixes within a within a strike group um, rotation. Uh, but uh, but yes, that that is uh, that is uh, the the plan. Once shoot uh, exits out of the other yards, I'll fold into uh, that strike group um, as a as a air defense commander. And when you arrive at the ship this summer. Will you go straight in as CEO, or is it an XOCO fleet up? It's it direct as commander. Direct, directly, directly as CEO. Uh, just, just, just like, uh, just like we're doing with the cruisers. Cruisers. Uh, yep. So, direct, yep, directly as CEO. No, no XOCO fleet up. Awesome, awesome. Well, congratulations on that. I mean, that's uh, that's big news. And and going out to the FDNF, you'll be you'll be right there. You know, on the front line of everything that we're we're really talking about in proceedings these days with the American Sea Power Project and the war of 2026 scenario. And, you know, so deterrence will be uh, your mission. You'll be on the front line of all of that. Uh, so Holman, we're, we're about out of time. Uh, are there any questions I should have asked that I didn't get to ask you or any, anything you'd like to throw at our, uh, our audience? Uh, it's just been great, a great conversation with you today. Uh, great. Thanks again for having me. Um, you, you addressed, you addressed pretty much uh, um, the, the questions that, uh, that I, that, that, that I wanted to, to, to tease out. Um, if I may, I just wanted to, you know, stress a, you know, couple things. One, there, there are, there are, and, and, and you, you spoke to this, and we've, we've had this conversation that, you know, there's a lot of great things going on in the world of surface ship maintenance today, and there are a lot of challenges that are that 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 we have to face um, as a surface community as it relates to surface ship repair maintenance. Um, it's a wicked problem set. I also acknowledge that um, that there were, I use my Hopper experience in in the article. Um, but but I, you know probably could have teased out that there were some positive things that that did happen. Um, I'm a generally positive guy, uh, so uh, there there were some positive there were some positive things that came out of it. Um, you know there were uh, you know as as the levers that I can pull with culture on, on board Hopper, there were some really good things that happened. Um, you know that that uh, that while I can't you know grasp and quantify as that hey when i when i gave this contractor a high five it resulted in you know two less days of work you know can't can't do that that cleanly but certainly could could look at things that 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 uh, that that i was able to leverage with a good culture on board um uh, on board on board hopper and within the, the within the maintenance team so uh if but if we but if we want to get better than where we are right now um if we want to get from you know where the number is roughly 50 percent or so completion on time we want to make that number better and get you know of course ideally we want it to get to 100 percent um i'd submit to you that one of the things that we should look at in addition to what is every what, what everyone else is doing uh is how we can refit our culture um and um and i i, I submit that that as one soft ingredient that we can add uh into the gumbo so again, thank you so much for your time, Bill, and I really appreciate everything that you and your team do. Uh, and thank you again for allowing me to jump into the public discourse about this such a, an important topic. Well, thanks for uh, for writing and for being with me today. Uh, my guest has been Captain Holman Agard, U.S. Navy. His article, Surface Ship Repair Culture Needs a Refit. It's in the January issue of Proceedings. And, and Holman, uh, just a great conversation today. Enjoyed it very much. 
Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate you. All right. Today's episode was brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute who support the open forum for those who dare to read, think, speak, and write about sea power. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. If you're planning to attend the Surface Navy Association's National Symposium, 9 to 11 January in Crystal City, Arlington, Virginia, please stop by the Naval Institute booth. We'd love to see you there. And remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.